this is my research, which I worked on for the last eight years. It's about a small marginalized community of corpse burners called the Domes, who are cremators at Banaras. And they, of course, are a Dalit subcaste. And um, unfortunately, they're still uh, considered to be untouchables by a majority of dominant caste Hindus. So um, just to give you a sense, when we think of Banaras in our public consciousness, it is a city that um, is, you know, brings these senses of peacefulness and calm. And of course, you think of the holy Ganges flowing. Um, it's a city of pilgrims, temples, um, meandering gullies. But today, I'm going to show you a different face of Banaras. This is the Mani Karnika Ghat. This is where the domes work. And just to give you a sense of it, uh, this is uh, the cremation ground where there are a lot of men milling about. In the background, you can see buffaloes in the river. And uh, you can also see a boat filled with firewood. In the foreground, in the lower uh, left side corner of the frame, you'll see corpses. And they are covered in something called a shroud, which is a drape that uh, the corpses, when they are delivered to Manika Ghat, they come covered in that. And I'll tell you the significance of the shroud later in the conversation. So I'm going to ask you to take a moment and really take in the elements of this frame. There's a corpse burner running between two pyres. And the ground beneath him radiates heat. There is immense smoke, which you can't see here, but there's immense smoke at Manikanika Ghat. It really engulfs you. And um, there is so much ash flying in the air that it stings your eyes and it visually temporarily impairs you. Um, in the background, there are uh, abandoned bamboo beers on which the corpses are delivered. And in the foreground, of course, there are the shrouds that I talked about. So um, one thing about the corpse burners is that they start off into this profession very young, around the age of 10 or 11. And they begin burning corpses. Um, and because it's such an exhausting and unrewarding and dangerous profession, because they are working with fire and inhaling a lot of smoke, um, this, they die at a very young age, in their late 50s to early 60s. And to cope with the exhaustion um, and just the sights and the sounds of this very hostile working environment, they uh, start consuming alcohol at a very young age, uh, they start um, doing drugs, just to cope with all the stressors over there. And um, this is an image of a young Kavi Chaudhary who's 13 years old from the Dome community. So what happens is um, young boys around the age of five or six years old are pushed out into, from their homes uh, to Manikarnika Ghat to pick up these shrouds. Um, and what they do with these shrouds is that they scavenge them and then they sell it to, uh, uh, to uh, wholesale uh, shopkeepers, and the shopkeepers then wash the shrouds, they iron it, package it, and then they sell it to morning customers once again. But just to make a point here that he is working at 10 o'clock at night, and uh, he's making a livelihood at this point, instead of being in the security of his home and the comforts of his home. So we will get more into that in detail with Sanjoy, and um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Radhika. Uh, you know, I started going to uh, Banaras uh, maybe seven or eight years ago when we started the Mahindra Kabira Festival. And uh, when we decided that we would do this in Banaras, my colleagues, after the first visit, said that they wouldn't take me because if I went there, I'd say it was a filthy city and I wouldn't agree to do uh, the festival. And of course, I arrived in the middle of pouring monsoon rain. There were floods. Our car broke down in the middle. Uh, I'm allergic to most things that have greeny trees, etc. So I got down, immediately vomited, and the vomit sort of came back towards me. So it was pretty horrific. And then I got to the river. 
and you know, squill squelch across the ghats, you get onto a boat, and then something happens, a switch goes off, and the river is transformative as you sail down this incredible vista of built heritage. Radhika, you started going, you're an Iyengar girl, and for those of you who maybe don't know, Iyengars are pretty much top of the, of the food chain. They're, they're Brahmins of the highest order. You decided to go to Banaras and start working with domes. What was the inspiration? What was that thing that triggered in you? So um, it just began as a student project, to be honest. And I was pursuing my master's in journalism. And we had to submit a thesis. And I was looking for something to report on, something which was in-depth and did make a lot of, uh, you know, just something serious that needed to be reported on and wasn't reported about earlier. And so I was going through, um, I, was, I was researching and I found one article about the dome community and I was immediately very, very curious because I did not know that there was an existence of a community that specialized in cremating the dead. And um, so I went back and dug a little deeper, and I realized that all the information that was available at that time only focused on the dome community's work at the cremation ground. They weren't informed, alternative, accessible narratives surrounding this community. Um, so just to give an example, what, what do the kids feel when they are working at Manikarnika Ghat? Um, surely nobody wants to grow up to be a cop spanner. So how does that impact them psychologically? How do they spend their days? Um, are they getting access to education? Um, and how is the internet influencing their lives? Or about the men, um, how do they feel working there uh, constantly for a pitiful amount of money? How does that impact them? And of course, the women, why are they unseen from public spaces? Why are they not um, stepping out of their homes? Are they allowed to earn a living? Do they have re reproductive freedom? Do, um, are they invited in family conversations to make decisions with the family? Um, so all of these questions were preoccupying my mind and re I really wanted to um, explore that. And that's how it began. Did you want to just share with us the myth that started the Dome Raja and the Dome community? So there is uh, this legend that is circulated by the members of the Dome community that uh, once there was, you know, there was Goddess Parvati and Lord Shiva, they were at Manika Nikaghat and she lost one of her earrings. Her earring. And uh, a Brahmin man found the earring, and instead of returning it to her, he pocketed it. And of course, Shivji was looking everywhere for it, and he eventually found out that this man um, had not returned the earring. So um, he got extremely angered, and he cursed this man. He said, from now on, your descendants, you and your descendants, are going to belong to the lowest caste. And this man, of course, was groveling for forgiveness. And so Shivji, then his heart melted. He actually did penance. He did penance for a yes. while to appease Shivji. Yes. And, uh, and then finally, Shivji said, OK, I'll give you a boon, which is the sacred fire, that you and your family and your descendants will have the ownership of the sacred fire, which will be burning for centuries. And only using this sacred fire can a Hindu um, when they're cremated, will the Hindus, uh, with the, will the deceased soul receive moksha, which is salvation? So um, that is one of the legends that, uh, that, that is being circulated, yeah. And perhaps the other legend that we need to just look in. So as many of you know, if you die in Banaras, uh, which is between the Asighat, uh, the, the, uh, the Asighat and what's the rivers? The, the Varuna and, and the Assi rivers, you go instantly to heaven. So even people who are ill and are in the Benares Hindu University Hospital, check out, cross the bridge, come to this particular region to die so that they can go to heaven. But maybe the myth on that. Yes. 
No, they do, and and it's believed that Manikarnika Ghat um, is is the holiest of the two cremation grounds because there's Harish Chandra Ghat as well in Banaras, but it is um, a larger cremation ground, and therefore it in Hindu um, religion it ha it holds great significance. The book is a book of nonfiction, and yet uh, Radhika has been able to pepper it with such amazing filled out characters. How did you? come upon uh, these characters? Um, you must have met so many different families. How did you come across with, you know, the lady who lost her husband, for example, or the young lad who becomes such a protagonist in your story? So, um, that's a great question. I, whew, I went to Manikarnika Ghat and uh, the first few times, of course, I tried approaching the the members, the, the, the members of the dome community, the corpse burners over there, and uh, they weren't very forthcoming. They weren't uh, very open to having a conversation with me. And obviously, because I'm, I'm an unfamiliar entity to and them. And you're a girl. And I'm a girl. So they weren't used to the idea of a woman approaching them and having a conversation with them. So um, it really took me a while to build that rapport with them where they felt secure enough and comfortable enough to speak to me. And that was only because I kept returning to Manika Nikaghat over and over again. And the periods when they wouldn't be talking to me, I would pull back, I would sit down, I would just observe Manika Nikaghat, what was happening there, how, they how the men interacted with each other, how they set up the pyre. Um, for the women, it was, when it, when it came to speaking to the women at the dome, in the dome community, it was, I would say it wasn't as uh, difficult as um, approaching the men, but it was relatively easier because um, I, I could speak to them in the privacy of their homes as a woman. Um, and even though we came from different worlds, there were, there were things that we could talk to and relate uh, to. And, um, and I think a male journalist would not be able to do that, to get that access, because otherwise the husbands would usually sit with the, their wives. And of course, they were very, the women were curious, the men were curious, they would ask me, what are you doing? Why are you asking us questions about our lives? And I had to tell them that I'm working on a book and I'm interested in documenting their stories, um, what their dreams are, what their challenges are. And, um, and over a period of time, as I became a familiar presence, um, they pulled their guard down. You know, that's what happens. It's human interactions. That's how we get to Was know each other. Was there a tipping point when this happened, when suddenly from being an outsider, and you were an outsider in the dome community, and you know, where women are not necessarily even allowed out, and we'll come to that. Was there a tipping moment where you were able to see that you've won their trust? Was there an incident? Was there a conversation with Dolly? Um, there were many, I feel, but uh, I think just the idea of sitting down and having conversations with them is, is really what helped them trust me. Because otherwise people, they're used to people coming and talking to them for a day or two days. And then they say, okay, bye, see you. And they don't show their faces ever again. And I was someone who was doggedly curious. I was, I doggedly kept returning to, to Chan Ghat to talk to them, to sit down. And I was, I think at the end of the day, they just need someone to listen to, the women specifically. Um, if you are talking to them and and without any judgment, you know, um, they, they, they can see that. And our conversations were sometimes very serious, very intense. Sometimes they took a lighter tone. Um, and, and I think it was, it was that, those, those, um, those small pe moments where, you know, you would just speak and you could, through the tone or their uh, facial expression, you, you learn something more um, about them and their personalities over a period of time. How did you come across, I'm sure you met so many different people, how did you cotton on to Dolly? So Dolly, I met through uh, Lakshya and Bhola, who are other individuals who I also uh, interview and talk to in the book. Dolly, I came across, the first time I met her, she, um, she was a completely vulnerable, sad, broken lady. Um, she is someone 
who, when we meet her in the book, she is a young widow, a mother of five children. And, um, and she, when I met her, she was just, you, you could tell that she had, she felt like she had no future because how, she was wondering of ways to support her children because in that community, a woman's identity and her financial um, uh, situation, all of that is heavily dependent on her husband. So when you lose a husband, um, and this is what Dolly told me, she said, now I feel my marriage ruined me, like who am I without my husband? So a woman's identity is very in inextricably linked to her husband. And, um, but and her own family and her in-laws? And her in-laws actually, 10 days after her husband passed away, they, they kicked her out of the house. Um, and so she had no place to go and thankfully her parents took her in. And, um, but there was no... But her brother was somewhat resentful about that. He was resentful because he didn't want to support her. He already had his own wife and his own children to support. Um, and they, again, like I said, the cops burners don't earn very much. So he was resentful about the fact that, oh my God, now I'll have to take care of her and her five children. So then Dolly decided to take matters in her own hands. So she opened one, um, a small makeshift Kirana store right uh, in front of her very small one room home. With a sari dividing. Yes, and then, um, and there would be the string on which she would hang all the, um, all the namkeen packets and biscuits and not, what not. But when she did that, it really stirred a lot of resentment within the community. She received a lot of flag for it because women are not um, allowed to earn a living. They're not supposed to have any kind of financial autonomy. And the community really felt that if Dolly opens a shop and starts earning, she might potentially inspire other women to go out and you know, start becoming businesswomen or, or, or entrepreneurs, doing and something. And even leaving the community lanes for a woman who was married was a big deal. Sorry? Leaving the lanes in yes. which they lived. Exactly, for a woman. yes. Yes, it was. Um, it, so, what happens is that women are, when they step outside their neighborhood, they have to be always accompanied by either their husband or a male relative. They can't step out, married women specifically, they can't step out um, without a male chaperone. And when they do that, they uh, have to cover themselves with something called a chadar, which is this net like fabric. And what it does is that it completely um, obscures their face in one sense. And by extension, it obscures their identity. So, um, so this chadar, and so that's what, that even when, I think that that's the thing about their identity, that they don't have any, um, any sense of self. Tell us a little bit about your backdrop, because at the end of the day, you were again in this community, which was completely alien to you. What is your background? Um, so my background is that I'm a journalist, and... Uh, Meaning, where did you study? And Sure. So I've, of course, done a master's uh, in journalism from Columbia University. That's where the thesis uh, project took place. Um, but just having said that, I am someone who always knew the existence of caste. I um, knew how prevalent caste is, how prevalent caste violence is in our country. But when I went to Manika Ghat, when I met the individuals in Jan Ghat, when I got to know them on a personal level, it really, that understanding of caste discrimination um, really like hit me on a deeper level because you hear their stories, you hear their struggles and it just, it just changes your whole perception. You realize how inhumane society is really. Um, just to give you an example, I, um, I used to, whenever I used to go to Manika Ghat during my field visits, um, some of the children would come with me from the dome community 
uh, and, we, and they would always avoid one particular gully. And they would always say, Didi, let's go from the other gully. Let's take a longer route. And I asked them eventually that, you know, why are you avoiding this particular gully? And I found out that there is one temple on that gully, on, in, on that way, um, where the priest shoes the children away every time he sees them. He doesn't want them anywhere near the vicinity of the temple. So he abuses them and he humiliates them. So they've decided they, they won't even pass, that, and they won't walk through that gully. And um, you know, you, you hear and you read about these horrific uh, acts of violence like lynchings and honor killings. But you, you don't hear about the smaller acts of violence that take place, how all of this, this trauma that the children go through, how it affects them psychologically. I think uh, just being there, reporting on the community, getting to know each of the individuals on a one-to-one -one level, you realize how deeply entrenched uh, the caste system continues to be even today. You know, one of the interesting things certainly that happened to me was you know, when you have long hair and you're seen to be a liberal, you assume that you're empathetic with everybody else. Till a colleague once said to me, you know, you have no idea what it is to be in a minority, be it, you know, a religious minority or a caste minority in this country. Our world is so completely different from their world. And yet, one of your characters actually is able to get out is able to go to college outside, hiding his identity. Yes, so the individual you're talking about is Bhola. And uh, Bhola, when I met him the first time, he's just such an enigmatic person. He, he is very intelligent, he's very outgoing, very articulate. And um, he, when, when he leaves, Chan Ghat, when he leaves his Basti and he goes to Ludhiana to pursue his higher degree in education at a private university, he, um, as you mentioned, he hides his caste. He doesn't let the dominant uh, caste classmates of his know his background. Um, so he doesn't use his surname? No, he uses his surname, but the thing is that as a Chaudhary, um, it's such a... You could a, be anything. Yes, it's, it's not def defined by a certain caste. So... Um, so he hides his caste, he doesn't let anyone know who he is, and so he tries everything in his power to fit into this middle class universe. He, he learns English to the best of his abilities. Um, interestingly, when I was reporting and I, I used to go to, um, when I was, I was visiting Banaras, I, I went with him to one of the restaurants um, to eat dinner, and we had ordered alu ki sabzi and paratha and all of that. And I watched how he picked up a fork and a knife and he cut the paratha with the knife and ate uh, the paratha with a fork. And I was very curious. I wondered why he did not tear the paratha with his hands, how it's traditionally eaten. So I asked him, I said, why, why are you doing that? Why aren't you eating like the normal way it's supposed to be eaten? And he looked at me and he said, you know, Everyone here at the restaurant is privy to the shared knowledge of how to behave, how to eat, how to speak, how to drink in public spaces. And he is someone that his own family or he did not have that experience while growing up, that people at a restaurant or anywhere else, you know, the dominant caste people, when they are born in a specific caste in class, you grow up learning these things organically. And here he has to teach himself. So he teaches himself by watching YouTube videos or he'll just see other people, he'll observe other people, how they are eating. Um, and a lot of other things, how to speak English properly. So he is a self-starter, he's someone who is who won't let anything come in his way. So what he, if he is from, um, from the dome community? He's going to push through, he's going to ascend professionally and socially, whatever it takes, he's going to do that. Um, so he's that kind of a person. How many of you have seen Masan, the movie? 
And of course, we've shown, uh, uh, Radhika has shared some of the images. You know, you talked about how hot it is, uh, you know, on the ground. You talked about the ash flying. You talked about how often they got hurt. Uh, either their, their foot got burnt or they got hurt when they went into the water, etc. And how difficult it is when somebody gets injured or when somebody falls ill. Yes, um, so Manika Nika Ghat is such a hostile working environment. Um, if you speak, if you think about the corpse burners, they are working with fire. Um, they, even when they're working with bamboo st sticks to, um, to stroke the pyre, they burn their hands, they sometimes step, accidentally step on hot ash, so they burn their feet. Um, the children as well, uh, when they're picking shrouds over there, first of all, they get bullied by uh, older men. They get hit around and abused. Um, and, and many times, because Manika Nika Ghat is such a place where things are just uh, scattered, you know, you'll find nails somewhere and um, glass, uh, like razors sometimes even. It's, it's just a lot of... A lot of muck is there as well. And the children, when they're uh, scavenging for shrouds, they sometimes accidentally step on that and they hurt themselves. And, um, and then the only way they know how to heal, um, like how to f mend their wound, is they pick up mitti from the Manikarnika Ghat and they spread it over their wound. And sometimes, of course, if they get a chance, they go back home and their mothers uh, dip cloth in warm kerosene oil and um, they dab that on the wound. And sometimes they'll just use marigold flowers which are lying about in Manika Nika Ghat. They'll squish it, they'll make a paste and they'll put that on their wound. So these are things they've learned on the job, how to take care of themselves because there's nobody else to take care of them. But for an earning member of the family, especially the older uh, people, for them falling ill is an impossibility because in many ways they are gig workers if they don't work that day they don't eat. Yes, so um, that's true. And I think uh, it's something which is it's very disconcerting because if the men don't go to work, um, it's a hand-to-mouth existence, right? So if you go to work, you earn money and you come back and you buy, um, if that's the way you feed your family. Um, and one of them said that I, I have to go, I have to go every day, even when I'm sick, when I'm unwell, I have to convince myself that I need to go out and earn. Nahi to chula kaise jalega? How will the kitchen run? Um, and sometimes when they do fall sick, when they don't have any other alternative um, and they have to stay back at home, that's when they take loans and that's how they fall deeper into debts. And, and the kids, you know, you showed us that photograph of the kid, you know, trying to take the, sh the shroud, and they go out there earlier, so the, the youngest kids go out there earlier, so they don't get bullied by the older kids. And you talked about how the shrouds were then recycled, uh, but they're also dadas, everything has a dada, right? Everything has a, has a boss, and the, the way it's set up, tell us that structure in which the domes operate with the big dada and then the um, so interestingly, like you mentioned, uh, of course, there is the dome caste, which is um, unfortunately at the lowest rung of the caste order. But within that community, there is a class hierarchy. And at the top, there are maliks or bosses, who are the ones who own something called a pari, and I'll, I'll come to that. Um, and they are the ones who... Uh, have some kind of social clout in the community. And below them are managers. And each Malik employs one or two managers who, are, who do clerical work, who do the overseeing of the proper running of the cremation ground, who do bookkeeping. And, um, and then Maliks hire the cremators, the corpse burners. They recruit them. And, so, um, and Maliks have ownership of something which I mentioned, the pari, which is this sh working shift. And a party can be anywhere, I mean, it can be a four-day party or a nine-day party or an 11-day party. And, um, and, and that's the period where the workers are allowed to work. 
and um, a pari can be bought or sold or gifted or mortgaged. Um, but this is also, it can only be done within the caste. It's very caste bound. So you can't sell a pari to someone who is from a different caste. In all of this, do you see hope? Is there a, is there a need for transformation? Is there seen to be a need for transformation? Are they aware that this is what they've been born to do? And that sense of hopelessness because of which they then start drinking and say, that's the only way that we can cope. Yeah, that's a great question. I think the sense of hopelessness is, is very much there. Because if you are told since the time you're very young that this is where you're born, this is what you're going to grow up to do, you are going to cremate corpses, um, this is what your life is going to be, and you're also told at the same time that you're an untouchable, that you are a good for nothing. Even though these, these narratives are not true, the more you hear it over a period of time, the more you start believing in it. And so even Bhola says many times, I know that my worth is nothing right now. So one day I'm going to become something and that's when I'm going to tell the world who I am, that I'm a son of a corpse burner. Um, but there are multiple layers to this, um, this situation because uh, interestingly, just to give you an example, George Gray, who's this American sponsor, he sponsors the education of four dome boys from the community. So he was in a conversation with one of the local dominant caste men and he said, I'm going to be educating four boys from the community. And, um, and that man turned around and said, Lekin murda kon jalayega? Who is going to burn the dead? And that exchange in itself speaks volumes of how the powerful or those people in power don't want the people, the voiceless, or the people who don't have power to progress. And um, interestingly also, if you, if you narrow the lens a little bit more, what happens is within the community also, people don't want the other person to succeed. So um, when Bhola goes um, to one of his neighbors and uh, he says that, um, actually he goes to one of his bosses who he sells the shrouds to and he says that I'm going to go, I'm going to leave Banaras, I'm going to go and study. And that man sits him down and he says, Beta tum dome ho. You are a dome, you are the son of a corpse burner and you can grow up to be nothing more than a cremator. And he's also, Bhola has also heard other people tell him that, you know, you might take two, uh, one step ahead, but we'll pull you back two steps. You know, so there is no sort of support or encouragement while he was growing up. So these are Bhola's experiences, which he told me. And, um, and yeah, and at a, at, a, at a very, very core level also, there's the family, right? If you are, really underprivileged, you, you're struggling with finances, you will pull your children out of school um, and ask them to go work at Manika Nika Ghat and make a living because the, the household needs to run. So, um, so education is not a priority then, you know, earning becomes a priority. So there and, are many- And yet they feel invincible. During COVID, you've written in your book how even as so many hundreds and thousands were dying, bringing bodies to Manikarnika Ghat, many of the power burners were like, but COVID's not going to touch us. Yes, uh, COVID was a very terrifying and terrible period. Um, and there was this immense wave of panic at that time. And uh, I'm just going to, I'm going to pull back a bit and then uh, talk about the arrogance also that comes up eventually. But um, so when COVID took place, a lot of the cops burners, they, of course, they retreated into their homes. They didn't want to go out and work with a dangerous disease. And then there were the managers who actually went door to door and they pulled out the cops burners and said, you have to work because bodies were piling up. Um, and it was just chaos. And um, I remember Mohan telling me, who's, who's one of the cops burners, he said that, um, we, we didn't want to work, but we had no choice. 
and um, and the, the period was such that over there the the people who were grieving they would come and they started giving uh, corpse burners 2000 5000 rupees to burn their loved one their deceased loved ones because it it, it was very difficult at that time and someone like mohan who would earn somewhere ru around rupees 200 to 250 under normal circumstances was earning 5000 rupees per cremation so um and at that time, of course, the prices of everything were skyrocketing. Um, the prices of firewood um, increased, samagri increased, the cost of everything increased, crematory services increased. And um, so corpse burners did make um, some sort of um, margin, uh, sorry, some sort of profit marginally. But at what cost? Because they were really going out there and, and working in a very dangerous environment. Um, so yes, and then of course, over a period of time, the arrogance started coming because Mohan, who's this corpse burner, he said that, you know, every time I went there, nothing happened to me. So, um, and there's this one scene he describes, I mean, it's in the book, where he is, uh, he's coming from the cremation ground, and at that time, if you remember, everyone was expected to wear masks and keep a distance, six feet distance, and uh, so the, the cops stopped him, and they started manhandling him and saying that, you know, why aren't you wearing a mask, and we are going to fine you, etc., etc. And he said, wait a minute, I'm just, I'm coming from burning all the corpses, and I'm fine. So the cops just, took a step back, you know, and so then Mohan said, okay, can I go now? And the cops then, of course, let him go. But uh, the arrogance comes in from that, that thankfully nothing happened to him and nothing happened to the other cops burners. Um, but yes, and they also believe that hum to Shivji ke nagri mein reh reh. we are staying in a city where, where you know, on Shivji's feet, um, so nothing will happen to us. So all of those... We're protected. Yes. It's protected. not only a story about great despair. There is hope, but I'm not going to give that out. You have to go and buy the book and read it to get that bit of it. But let's get some questions. Uh, so a question here. I will take it in two bunches. I'll come to that lot in the second question here. Yeah, and, to the, and then after that, to the, to the lady in the yellow and the pink, and then at the back. Yeah, go ahead. Keep the questions short, please. Yeah. Uh, of course, but we, I'll try, because there's so many people who don't understand Hindi. We'll translate it, but up to you. Okay. Uh, if you had an option, if you could, what is one thing that you would like to change in their lives? What's the one thing that you'd like to change in their lives? If you had your way. Yeah. Not that you necessarily so, need to do that, but... Radhika, you've spoken about how, uh, you know, the corpse burners were kind of inured to the idea of death because uh, that's how they make a living, is what you said. In fact, you've used the phrase, it was business as usual. So for them, it is uh, a certain way. But for you, when you had to, you know, experience that upfront, you've spoken about how you connected with the people. But, uh, you know, having this uh, environment in this particular scenario that you had to almost immerse yourself in during the course of this experience. What was that like for you? Even though, what you know, was the experience like? The lady in the glasses? May I, may I answer? Oh, sorry, the lady in the blue. Ho may ho I answer hold, to hold, 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 hold. We'll I'll do forget. one more. <laughs> one more. Clusters. Take more questions. Yeah. Uh, namaste, Radhika. So, um, just hold it closer to you, please. Yeah, sure. So, um, one, one part of the question is what exactly is the scale of you know, this entire community? Like, what are the kind of numbers? And did that dictate the title for your book? Because you've named it Fire Thanks. So scale, what is the one thing that you can change if you want to? And uh, her personal experience. Okay, so I'll start with responding to your question. Yes, absolutely. I was, um, it affected me quite deeply. Um, if I'm, I mean, if you go to Manika Nika Ghat, just the sight and sounds of the place to see these corpses coming in, um, it's, it's a very, very disturbing sight uh, to, to see how the, the skin is melting or um, the smoke and, uh, and, and people 
breaking down and I mean all of that will affect you. I mean I'm a human at the end of the day, right? Um, and there were times when I felt like giving up. Not only because of what I saw at the cremation ground, but also the experiences that I heard of, uh, you know, the individuals who I spoke to. I mean, everything affected me. And, the, and I, the, there was a point where I, I, I took a break from the manuscript for two to three months, and I said, maybe I don't think I can do this. And I sat with myself, and I had to convince myself that this is something of great importance, that these individuals have taken time, and they've given me time, They've sat down with me and they've told me their stories. Um, if I don't write, if, if this book You'll is not... You'll fail them. You'll fail them I'll if fail you don't. them. If the the yeah. one thing that you can change if you could? One thing I could change. I think I would really want the women in that community to have more... Empowerment. Um, empowerment. And I want the, the girls um, to get more edu education. Like ed education that I want them to be able to... Independent. Yes, absolutely. So and the, the scale? Um, numbers of people, numbers of doors? Yes, so uh, this particular Basti was uh, about 25, 20 to 25 family members who I spoke to. Um, and then how I went on um, choosing the people who I wanted to feature in the book was entirely actually because of how how accessible they were to me, how many felt comfortable speaking to me, um, how articulate they were in their thoughts. And also, I think it was more to do with how many people wanted to tell me their stories and, um, and if they had a goal, you know, if they were heading somewhere. For example, like Bhola, I, I knew that he was heading somewhere and I was very Don't give interested. it away. They have to read the Sorry. book to find out. Okay. It's a couple of hundred, actually, between split between some of the Bastis. I'm sorry, I'm going to take... You can ask her the question when you get there. Yes, in the third row, and the gentleman in the white uh, and black T-shirt and the one at the back, yeah. Hi, thanks. Short, we've got one minute left, quickly. Uh, yeah, I just wondered how you're going to, like, launch the book. Are you going it with them, with the people in that community? And, you know, what kind of... Uh, um, um, how will you involve them? Yeah. How, how will you involve them in the launch of the book? The gentleman, yeah, just right here, yeah, and then one at the back. Uh, my question is: there isn't it that a, a sort of hypocrisy in our society that uh, you know uh, when your loved ones are alive, you are not allowed to touch those people's, and when they're leaving, when they're departing from the world, okay, they are respectfully, you know, making them leave the world. This is a hypocrisy of the society. Hypocrisy, brilliant. What, what, Thank you. The lady in the khaki shirt. Short question, please. Yeah, sure. So I would like you to share some... Closer, please. Don't share anything. Just ask could the you, question. Could, could you shed some light on the inclination towards using drugs or possibly substance abuse in this Drugs society? and substance abuse, uh, hypocrisy, and how are you involving them in the release of your book? Um, yes, I would definitely involve them. Uh, they're already aware that the book has been released and uh, Bola is, is, is reading the book because he's the only one who's educated enough to read it. Um, regarding the hypocrisy, yes, definitely. That's what my book also attempts to do and I, I've talked about it, about the dichotomy that exists, that there is, they're considered to be untouchables, but at the same time, they'll go to the cremation, uh, you know, the dominant caste Hindus will go to the cremation ground and then expect the domes to do the work of um, doing the final farewell for their loved ones. So it's, it's definitely there. The, hip the hypocrisy is, is very, very deep in our society. Um, substance abuse. Yes, and substance abu abuse. Yes, the children, um, they, they consume drugs and they chew gutka and all of that, but they do it not because... It's not a kind of a flex. It's, it's not done for recreational purposes. It's, it's done to cope with the immense stressors of working in those conditions. They're trying to uh, cope with fatigue. They're trying to cope with the work pressure. They're trying to cope with peer pressure. They're trying to cope with hunger. Um, there, there's so many things that they're trying to cope with and they're so young and they're expected to earn. You know, who, instead of being in school, they're, they're working over there. So they're doing it to cope. Ladies and gentlemen, from stardust to just dust, uh, fire on the Ganges, Radhika Iyengar, thank you so much.
Go out and get the book. It's brilliant.